proliferation like we see with post-gastric bypass patients, but they all mean the same thing, so it can get a little confusing. The cell biologists probably get driven nuts by it. So really on the right side, post-gastric bypass hypoglycemia is a syndrome of late dumping, and any of those mechanisms can be involved. Beta cell hyperfunction, unmasked underlying familial hypoglycemia that's exposed by gastric bypass patients, lack of regression of beta cell mass after weight loss, or GLP-1-mediated beta cell proliferation. When you look at these patients, there may be other causes in patients who have gastric bypass that can be causing hypoglycemia, factitious hypoglycemia, insulinoma. So those have to be ruled out. So uh, I came up with this final definition, post-gastric bypass hypoglycemia is non-insulinoma, pancreatogenous, hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. That's what I tell my patients, or just low blood sugar. Uh, what's the incidence? Well, uh, this study showed that hospitalizations for hypoglycemia is 0.2% after gastric bypass. So it's not common. It's fairly rare. This may be underestimating it because a lot of these patients will just be showing up in your clinic frequently. There's no increased risk after restrictive operations like VBG or adjustable gastric band. There's very little data on sleeve, but I'll assume that they fall into the second group. So primarily we talk about gastric bypass. Now let's look at some of the mechanisms. Beta cell hyperfunction, I'm not gonna give this too much air time. This basically postulates that with increased beta cell secretion of insulin and the subsequent weight loss, uh, you have autonomous secretion. But when you have patients with insuloma with a lot of uh, secretion, they don't generally have severe obesity. And patients who don't have gastric bypass but have diagnosis of non-insuloma hypoglycemia, they're not typically severely obese. So it doesn't follow that persistent hypersecretion is the cause of this post-gastric bypass hypoglycemia. Another proposed mechanism is lack of regression of beta cell mass after gastric bypass, but this assumes that you have beta cell hypertrophy with obesity, and we know that obese patients don't generally have islet cell hypertrophy, so why does it need to regress? So I'm gonna forget about those two. This is a real syndrome, familial hyperinsulinism. These are patients who are born with hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. These are mutations of either the sulfonylurea receptor, the inwardly rectifying potassium channel, glucokinase, glutamate dehydrogenase. And if you have non-SIR1 autosomal dominant forms of these, it may be mild. The patient may have occasional hypoglycemic attacks, not realize it. And when they finally do have a gastric bypass uh, and all the other mechanisms involved, it gets unmasked. But what I really want you to take away that this is primarily a syndrome of the glucagon-like peptide 1. The GLP-1 and gastric inhibitory peptide are, are the incretins that stimulate insulin secretion, inhibit glucagon, this lowers your blood glucose. So when you have distal delivery of nutrients to your intestines, they get exposed to L cells which secrete GLP-1. In addition to insulin secretion, we know that they also increase beta cell mass, and this has been shown in rats. So with non-insuloma pancreatogenous hypoglycemia, you have patients with isolated postprandial hypoglycemia. They have hyperinsulinemia on testing. They have a negative 72-hour fast, which would indicate that they perhaps have an insulinoma. Uh, that's a cult. You have diffuse islet cell hypertrophy on pathology. And in this study by service uh, from Mayo, 10 patients were treated successfully at subtotal pancreatectomy. If you have a patient in your practice who is complaining of any of these nucleo, uh, neuroglycopenic syndrome, syndromes, you can give them a questionnaire like this, ask them how often it happens, what makes it better or worse. You take a detailed history. You'll generally check a fasting and postprandial glucose, insulin, C-peptide level to rule out factitious hypoglycemia. And in a monitored 72-hour fast, they get put in the hospital, uh, capillary blood sugar checked every two hours, and uh, uh, looking at how often they have their blood sugar drop below 40 or get symptomatic. Remember, there are patients who have occult insulinoma, and so you, if you suspect this, you can rule it out with a spiral CT of the pancreas, uh, EUS, transgastric ultrasound of the pancreas. And this third one is really for patients who you have already come down the line and you're doing preoperative planning uh, for a possible pancreatectomy, but insulin secretion measured in hepatic, the hepatic vein with selective intraarterial calcium injection in the gastroduodenal artery, the SMA, and the splenic artery. And then you can biopsy and then look at pancreatic histopathology looking for beta cell hyperproliferation. 
While you're doing all this, you have to treat them. So dietary modification is first, four to five small meals, low carbohydrates, high in protein and fiber. They should carry snacks around with them and frequent capillary blood sugar monitoring. There is medical treatment, a carbos, which is an anti-diabetic medication that inhibits alpha-glucosidase. Diazoxide, which is an antihypertensive, also inhibits insulin secretion. It's a potassium channel activator. It does have side effects like fluid retention, bone marrow suppression, so you have to be careful. Octreotide and glucocorticoids have been described, but it's not quite as validated as the other two. Nifidipine is used uh, in neonates, but uh, it can also be tried in adults. And ultimately, surgery for the refractory cases, and this is a pancreatectomy of some level, uh, they've been described as total, near total, subtotal, distal pancreatectomies, often with preoperative uh, intraarterial selective calcium injection to identify where most of the beta cell hyperperforation is. Bypass reversal has been done too, but with variable results. It's pretty much a toss up if this patient's going to improve. And the suspected reason for this is they may already be too far gone with the beta cell hyperperforation, or you may have to wait months, and they may not have months to wait if they're very symptomatic. So here's a case study, 45-year-old male, his initially a BMI of 42, underwent laparoscopic ruin-wide gastric bypass. He had no personal family history of any hypoglycemic, neuroglycopenic symptoms or diabetes. In 9 to 12 months, he lost a lot of weight. He was a BMI of 22. So he was undernourished, he had daily palpitations, sweating, profound fatigue, confusion, disorientation. He underwent a cardiac, hepatic, renal, adrenal, pituitary workup. It was all normal. Uh, capillary blood glucose monitoring correlated with his hypoglycemic symptoms. This is about uh, between 40 and 50 milligrams per deciliter. He was given a mixed meal challenge with glucerna. His insulin was up, his glucose was down. He underwent a monitored inpatient fast for 72 hours. This was negative. This suggests that he does not have an insulinoma. So he was getting isolated postprandial hypoglycemia. The hypoglycemia was thought to be from dumping in this case. Remember, the entity we're talking about is an entity of late dumping and chronic undernutrition. He was starting on preprandial octreotide, supplemented with cornstarch, promod, benin calorie. However, his symptoms increased in severity and frequency. So he was then starting diazoxide, 150 milligrams TID, nifedipine. The mixed meal test was repeated. He again had hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. He was negative for sulfonylureas. A spiral CT showed no pancreatic lesions. He was ruled out for MEN1, VIP gastrin, PTH, chromogranin A, serotonin, and hydroxyindoacetic acid levels. So he finally underwent a selective intraarterial calcium injection. In a hepatic vein, you can see the measurements here. It was most uh, uh, exaggerated in the splenic artery, so this is the body and tail of the pancreas. So he underwent a distal pancreatectomy, a reversal of the bypass was offered uh, with the knowledge that the effectiveness of this would be unknown. And he was found to have no insulinoma in the, pan in the pancreatic specimen. This is his specimen. On the left is what a normal pancreas looks like. It's stained for glucagon, so the dark portions are the islets of Langerhans. And on the right, you can see there's diffuse islets of hyperplasia. He was tested for, uh, the, this probably should have been done earlier, but for the familial uh, syndromes of uh, sulfonylurea receptor 1, the uh, potassium channel and glucose kinase mutations, and he was negative for this. So this was not unmasked familial hypoglycemia. And the GLP-1 was uh, high. It was peaked at 328. It was free of hypoglycemic symptoms for months. After a few months, some of them, some of the symptoms re uh, recurred, um, with, but with decreased severity and frequency. and was uh, treated adequately medically. So in conclusion, post-gastric bypass hypoglycemia is late dumping. It's GLP-1 or cretin mediated islet cell hyper hypertrophy. Uh, it can also be unmasked familial hyperinsulinism, so this should be ruled out. They're essentially treated the same. In treatment, dietary modification, small, frequent, low-carbohydrate meals, fasting and postprandial glucose, insulin, C-peptide, frequent monitoring, rule out factitious hypoglycemia, screen for MEN1, insulinoma, and uh, if you get all the way down to it, selective intraarterial calcium injection. The medical treatment, dizoxide and ifedipine, which are antihypertensives, acarbose, octreotide, which are less validated, and surgically, you're ultimately, for these fractured patients, looking at pancreatectomy. So it's, it's a rare entity, um, but when patients have it, they, they suffer, it's bad, and, and uh, they're going to go down this route of uh, uh, surgery. That's it. Thank you. Don't go away. Is Dr. Jamie Adair in the, in the audience? 
Good. So okay. why don't we discuss your presentation now? Sure. Uh, so you don't have to wait uh, for I'll the. You can stay at the mic. Stay oh, at yeah, the podium. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Tsuda regarding his presentation of hypoglycemia? This is a this is a really serious problem that we encounter in our patients. Now. Uh, since I don't see anybody coming to the microphone, or I don't see any questions here asked on my, on my computer, uh, how about 24 hours insulin monitoring? Uh, do you use that? Uh, put these patients on an insulin monitoring for 24 hours before we do other testing? No, um, generally just uh, been sending uh, postprandial and fasting, fasting insulin glucose. Um, uh, to be honest, most of these will be co-managed with an experienced endocrinologist. Um, uh, this particular patient was co-managed with um, Allison Goldfee at the Joslin Center in Boston. She, uh, she has looked at a lot of this problem. So um, I haven't done that. Have, I don't know if you have or others I've have. done it. I've done it. The endocrinologist wants me to do that before I do anything else. Can you identify for the audience yourself? Mark Pleatman from Detroit. Just a logistical question. Um, I had tried to work up a patient with a sort of a fast, fasting or post uh, high glucose and a low glucose meal and, and to some of these studies, no hospital is willing to do that. They say, how are we going to get paid? Yeah, you, you got to send them out in that case. Um, send them out to where? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, at my hospital, I probably can't get the uh, selective intraarterial calcium stimulation of uh, insulin and hepatic veins, so I'd have to send those patients out. If they're really symptomatic, um, and you think this is what's happening, it can be really dangerous for the patient. And I think it's reasonable to send them to a, a center that uh, does this uh, frequently. Uh, send it, center send it to, through the ER, know. admit the patient to the ER, and then you yeah. get everything approved. Yeah. Sir, question. Hi, Jamie Loggins out in Maine. Uh, you mentioned briefly about not much is known about the sleeve, but uh, just in the past month, I've been presented with a patient showing up pretty much like you described, but six months after a sleeve gastrectomy. Went sure. very well, routine and I'm getting weekly calls from an endocrinologist and can't figure out what to do. Yeah, so that patient I start immediately thinking, is there some other mechanism? Because remember, this entity is an entity of uh, GLP-1 mediation, which is distal delivery of nutrients to the intestines, which you don't have with the sleeve. Right. So this patient may have familial hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia or an occult insulinoma. So a good place to start might be a 72-hour fast uh, imaging of their pancreas, either with EOS or spiral CT. And uh, you might want to have them genetic, test, uh, genetic it, tested also for the It's interesting because, like your patient, fasting glucoses are normal. It's only postprandial profound yes. hypoglycemia. Yes, it's because of that uh, stimulation of GLP-1. So we cannot reverse a sleeve. And we've seen reports of sleeve gastrectomy showing that there is dumping. Uh, what do we do with that patient with hypoglycemia that is not responding to... The sleeve patient? Yeah. Um, it's from the pancreas. They're going to have to go undergo pancreatectomy. You have to undergo pancreatectomy. Yeah. Because pancreatectomy, uh, again, from your, from your talk, one would imagine that that's the way to go. But I tell you that the consensus among surgeons is not that easy to do this with pancreatectomies in this patient population. Sure. Sure. But, you know, you have to make sure you rule out the other things, too, like facti factitious hypoglycemia and so forth. Yeah. With bypass, we, what we do is we put a G tube first, we admit them, or put a G tube, feed them through the G tube. If we see that the hypoglycemia resolves, uh, sure. then we, we reverse them. Sure. Uh, but yeah. it's anecdotal. You know, I can count with one hand how many cases we've done that, and it worked. Yeah. So thank God it's not that a prevalent complication, but when it happens, we get in trouble. Any other questions for Dr. Suda? Thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation.